Let us pray. You said it was good, God, your creation, and it was, and it is, and it shall continue to be so as we listen to your word, take it into our hearts and minds so that our living is transformed. Hear us as we worship and praise you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Patriarchy is our original sin. Now racism is America's original sin, the genocide of the indigenous peoples deemed savages by the trespassing colonist, paired with the enslavement of the less than human blacks stolen from Africa. But patriarchy, marinated in misogyny, may well be humanity's oldest sin. I'm no anthropologist, though I did major in sociology in college. I'm not a historian. I'm just a man looking at the mess of the world men have created. I began watching the first night of the Republican convention until our, I heard our president called the bodyguard of Western civilization. I confess, I watched a few more speeches, they were short, but I found the lies unrelenting, coming, as it was estimated, one every 56 seconds. And I just couldn't take it anymore. This man, perhaps more than any other man alive, epitomizes the sin of patriarchy. I mean patriarchy in its slightly broader sense, a system of society or government in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. And with that power, men have built, consolidated, wielded for most of the centuries of human development. We have, therefore, what we know is true today. Just one of the stunning things said by Ai-jen Poo last week when she spoke to us was that 70% of the U.S. workforce is made up of women who earn $60,000 a year less than men. Women fought for the right to vote, to be full citizens for decades after some men granted it to themselves from the beginning of the nation. This is the 90th anniversary of women's suffrage, and we should be celebrating it with joy. And we are. But it's not 90 years for black women whose race trumped their gender at the ballot box for decades more. And it's not 90 years for Asian women who would not become citizens with voting rights until 1952. And it's not been 90 years for indigenous women who became citizens in 1924, but were subjected to voter suppression tactics for decades more just as has happened with African Americans. All of that and so much more is why for a season we're going to focus here in our preaching from and about women in the Bible and beyond. We began with Ai-jen Poo last week and if you haven't heard her speech yet, Please listen to it as soon as you can. Reverend Lynn Harper wrote describing the essence of our focus during 
this next period. She wrote, we are living in times marked by gaping inequities, systemic racism, a lethal virus, mass death, coercive power, and narcissistic leadership, as well as by a spirit of protests, resistance, and transformation. In such a time as this, let us turn to the women in our scriptures for guidance and instruction. Let us listen anew to their stories and to the stories of others who have been pushed aside, past and present. May we hear their voices and know their wisdom, disentangled from misogynistic distortions. Let us hear from their distinct struggles, prophetic vision, and steadfast faith. In such a time as we find ourselves, may these women's courage in the face of oppressive power guide us in our pursuit of greater love, faith, and justice. So this morning, Eve. Genesis 1, those first 11 verses, we read of the prehistory of Israel, that mythical time before time that envisions creation and the chaos that plunged humanity back into the toil and trouble that seems ever to be the eternal story of Israel, if not all of us as well. We've seen a resurgence of violence in the Holy Land so that we no longer have confidence to even imagine an end and less to trust that Jared Kushner will devise any plan that does not worsen prospects for peace while favoring Israel and oppressing Palestinians. Middle East troubles only mirror the failure of most of the West to address the chaos inflicted on the third world and people of color across the globe today. But if the troubles of the world are our constant lot, any day a lesson in humanity, injustice, deprivation, and suffering, that is not the whole story. The prehistory in Genesis begins on a high note, a lofty vision of equality and inclusion that still inspires, that is still worthy of celebration and emulation. Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. Male and female, God created them. Dominion was given to humans over all else, land, sea, and air. We were all made in God's image. The language used in the original Hebrew is expansive and not gender specific. Adam means human. It was not the name of the first man, that guy in the Garden of Eden who generations of preachers have excused from responsibility for the fall from innocence to sin, laid squarely on the weakness of the woman. Some curiosity about the meaning of things, some agency about the human condition, some desire to learn and to know. These seem good things to me. We accomplish nothing without these impulses integral to our being, baked into our DNA, and the woman demonstrates them in the garden. So I say thank you, Eve. We are glad to know you, to be introduced to you, to know your name. But as we continue to read those first 11 chapters, we search in vain for a representative number of women with names. The man in the garden names his wife Eve. 
she gives birth to Cain and Abel. Abel is dead before he can marry a woman whose name we never learn. We would never learn. But the jealous killer Cain marries, and we never learn the name of his wife. The only other names of women in these first 11 chapters are the two wives of Cain's great, 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 great grandson, Lamech. They are Adah and Zillah. And I'm certain they are only mentioned to note the contributions of the lineage of their sons to humanity. The Bible tells us that one was the ancestor of all those who play the lyre and pipe, and the other the maker of bronze and iron tools. Other than that, it's all when Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. Jared lived after the birth of Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. We know they were creatures of their time and place. The writers of these mythical beginnings, these origin stories, we know evolution is the ultimate reality here, that we are on an arc that keeps extending, bending, we pray, toward justice, yes. This isn't so much a critique of who they were as it is an acknowledgement of where we've come from, an effort to uncover the rich pieces of our full humanity, hidden, suppressed, buried in narratives that too often do not see women clearly, do not hear and value their voices, do not name them as if their lives mattered. In Homer's Odyssey, Penelope comes downstairs from her private quarters and tells a bard to sing a more pleasant tune. He's depressing her. Her young, her young son, Telemachus, tells her, Mother, go back up into your quarters and get back to your room and gossip with other women. Work on your loom. Make things. Because, he says, speech will be the business of men all men, for mine is the power in this household. He tells his mother, we must hear women's voices today or we can't go forward. We deny the treasure of the fullness of our humanity. We know Eve isn't a historical person, rather a mythological figure constructed to explore the deep meaning, meanings at the core of the human existence, to explain the sometimes wondrous, sometimes vexing, sometimes painful experiences that shape and are the substance of our lives. Why, we ask, why? about so many things. It's an inescapable question. Why? Why is bringing life into the world accompanied by so much pain? Why do we work so hard, sometimes for so little return? Why does the snake crawl on its belly? Who is responsible for the way things are? Why sin and suffering and death? How did we go from the garden to the gutter to Gethsemane? Well, Eve got the blame. Eve. There are, are at least two scholarly camps about the actual words Sojourner Truth spoke in her famous speak at the Women's Rights Convention in 1851. 
One centers around the account of Marcus Robinson, a friend of Sojourners who heard the speech, he was present, and wrote about it soon after. The other, now standard version, is from the hand of Francis Gage, written and published 12 years later, after the speech, in 1863. And what is remembered most is, from Gage's version, that famous line, Ain't I a woman? That declaration, which is probably not Sojourner's, in just that way. Sojourner spoke Dutch until she began to learn English at 12 years old. She was raised in a Dutch colony in New England. She spoke English with a Dutch accent. The dialect of southern enslaved people was almost certainly not hers. But in the speech, in either version, Sojourner talks about Eve. She says in Gage's version, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all along, these women, gathered at that conference, these women together ought to be able to turn it right side up again. Amen, sister. Let me read again that latter part of our theme for the coming months into even next year. Let us listen anew to their stories and to the stories of others who have been pushed aside, past and present. May we hear their voices, know their wisdom, disentangled from misogynistic distortions, let us learn from their distinct struggles, prophetic vision, steadfast faith. So I could close with words from Michelle Obama's wonderful speech from the Democratic Convention or the speech given by Kamala Harris. We could revisit Elizabeth Warren's storing stirring declaration, she persisted. We could close with an image of that wonderful tennis player, Osaka, yesterday after winning the US Open, laying on the floor of Ash Tennis Stadium all those masks arrayed around her, naming the victims of violence. What an eloquent speech. Words detailing her vision. But I want to close with words from the story of Letetra Wildman, one of Jacob Blake's sisters. We all heard from her after his murder. After the deed was done, God asked Cain, where is your brother Abel? And Cain answers, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Lying and killing. There is too much of that going on. We've had enough of Cain and his ways. Let us listen to Letetra's answer to God's question, where is your brother? I am my brother's keeper. And when you say the name Jacob Blake, make sure you say father, make sure you say cousin, Make sure you say son, make sure you say uncle, but most importantly, make sure you say human. Human life. Let it marinate in your mouth, in your minds, 
a human life. Just like every single one of y'all and everywhere around the world, we're human. And his life matters. So many people have reached out to me telling me they're sorry that this happened to my family. Well, don't be sorry, because this has been happening to my family for a long time, longer than I can account for. It happened to Emmett Till. Mm. Emmett Till is my family. Mm. Philando, Mike Brown, mm. Sandra. This has been happening to my family. And I've shared tears for every single one of these people that it's happened to. Mm. This is nothing new. I'm not sad. I'm not sorry. I'm angry. Mm. And I'm tired. Mm. I haven't cried one time. I stopped crying years ago. Mm. I am numb. Mm. I have been watching police murder people that look like me for years. Mm. I'm also a black history minor. Mm. So not only have I been watching it in the 30 years that I've been on this planet, but I've been watching it for years before we were even alive. I'm not sad. I don't want your pity. I want change. Mm. 